Hello, everyone. I'm Siri Vaith, Executive Director of the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, CFRI, and I welcome you to this segment of our CF Community Voices podcast program and our specific podcast with Dr. Rick Moss on COVID-19 and CF. In March 2020, when we all began to shelter in place, uh, Dr. Moss participated in a town hall meeting on CF and COVID-19. And now 14 months later, we are recording our 15th podcast with him. As always, I must note that the information presented in this recording should not be used for as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And please consult with your physician or medical team before making any changes to your health management plan. I also want to thank our generous sponsors of this podcast series, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Gilead Sciences, Genentech, Beatrice, and Chiesi USA. We are grateful for their support. As we know, the information about COVID-19 and vaccines is changing rapidly, so please note that the information shared today is current as of Thursday, May 13th, 2021. And now on to the questions. Dr. Rick Moss has made major contributions to the international field of CF in the areas of research, education, and clinical care. He's the former director of the Stanford CF Center and professor emeritus of pediatric medicine at Stanford, where he continues to conduct clinical research. Lucky for us, he's also a member of CFRI's board. This has been a challenging time for all of us, and I know I speak on behalf of the entire CF community when I thank Dr. Moss for generously sharing his time and expertise with us as we continue to navigate this pandemic. Uh, as in previous podcasts, a long list of questions were submitted by members of our community, so now we will dive in. Welcome, Dr. Moss. Good to see you again. Podcast 15. Who would yeah. have ever thought? It's been a long haul, so to speak. It has been. Though I will say for everyone who's watching this, when this all started, um, Dr. Moss was always the one to say to me, look far ahead at the events we have planned, because this is not a short term thing. Um, the voice of reason very, very early on. So let's start with, as we always do, um, with the current report for the US uh, and globally on the number of cases and deaths from COVID-19, um, both total numbers, but also specific to the CF community. Sure. Uh, the CF Foundation updates uh, caregivers on a weekly basis, uh, has been doing so for some time. So. These figures are current as of today, May 13th. Uh, these are cases reported to the CF Foundation through the registry. So they may not be 100% complete, but they're pretty close. We have 1,460 confirmed cases in the CF community. About 70% of those are adults, which means over 440 children uh, with the diagnosis. And there about 16% of those cases have resulted in hospitalization. That's 227 cases. Only 14 deaths to date, uh, and that is less than 1%. And uh, that is actually very encouraging. The overall case fatality rate, that is deaths per diagnosed cases, for example, in the Chinese wave that began this whole thing was over 2.3%. So less than half of that in the CF community, which is really pretty amazing. Uh, but there are some uh, preponderances that you might, you might think intuitively makes sense. People with lung transplants, but 99 cases uh, among lung transplant recipients. And um, the majority of the deaths have occurred in lung transplant recipients or those with advanced lung disease. Um, there have been a, a little over 100 cases of advanced lung disease. On the good side, on the better side, uh, at least as of the report, over 4,000 CF patients have been vaccinated. Uh, it could be even higher and it should go higher, but that's what we have uh, reported to the foundation so far. Over in Europe, the uh, European CF Society keeps a similar uh, sort of a database. And as of April 16th, so there's a lag there, we haven't gotten the report for May yet. They had 1,136 cases, but the data is very similar about 27% of those are children, and about 19% of those have been hospitalized, and those are very similar percentages. They've had 13 deaths on that side, a little over 1%, so again, very close to the U.S. Um, information. That's kind of where we stand right now. Yeah, 
what is the state um, of the new variants? How many are there and is there any cause for alarm? How effective are the current vaccines in preventing major illness and or death due to the new variants uh, for fully vaccinated people? So that's actually a, a pretty complex question, <laughs> as you might imagine. Uh, there are a lot of variants. Um, many occur. Uh, those that rise to the level of, quote, variants of concern are those that are thought to be troublesome in terms of infection possibility as well as illness uh, and illness severity. So the, there are really four or five that people are focused on. The first one was from first to recognize the United Kingdom. Uh, so that's the so-called UK variant, which is called B117. That has a particular mutation in the spike in that area where the virus attaches to the human cell that is thought to increase infection and, and probably severity also. Uh, and that's become a dominant strain in most many parts of the world, uh, including many places in the US. It seems to uh, have taken over in Europe, obviously, but also now in India. Uh, there's an, uh, a variant of concern from South Africa that's called B1351. It has the same mutation and an additional concerning mutation in that same uh, critical area of binding. Brazil uh, is a third variant of concern, uh, the so-called P1 variant. All these have appeared in the United States, uh, and that has um, the same set of mutations uh, in terms of uh, ones that may be uh, more troublesome. California's had several uh, that have arisen uh, and that has a novel mutation, which is a bit different, which also may uh, be a problem. That's been a, something that's found primarily in Southern California, uh, but has spread also. New York City has a couple. And the most recent, uh, as most people know now in India, there's a variant that's called B1617, which has a, a two bad mutations and several others uh, that may be uh, also contributing to its, um, to its ability to infect and to cause illness. So the variants are here to stay. They're always changing because mutations are constantly arising. On the good side, the current vaccines seem to provide adequate protection against all the known variants at this time. I think it's fair to say uh, even though there are many reports that come out looking in the laboratory that show that they may be less effective than against the original strain, they still appear good enough to provide adequate protection. And those come from studies in various countries uh, which have had a high prevalence of these variants where the vaccines are still doing well. Now it's possible the mRNA vaccines are doing a little bit better than the J&J &J vaccine, but that's still unclear because we have too much of an apples versus orange comparison of the studies based on the populations the trials were done in. Um, so I think um, we have to keep our eyes on the variants uh, and be ready for the possibility that we may, may need boosters that are more tailored to them to augment the existing um, immunity that's provided by the current vaccines. That's certainly something that many people are talking about now, and I think are probably likely. Um, and so uh, as time goes by, it's likely that as immunity wanes from the initial vaccination and these variants continue to circulate and develop, we will probably need to get into a booster situation, which is not that scary a proposition. If you think about the flu, people are very used to getting annual flu vaccines. So I think ultimately we're likely to wind up in that kind of a situation, although that's certainly not uh, 100% predictable, but I think it's likely. There were two questions that were submitted together, but I'm going to reverse them to start because of what you said about the mRNA versus J&J. &J. And somebody had asked, is there any preference on which of the available vaccines CF patients should take if given an option, which earlier was no option, but now there might be options. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, most people don't have a lot of options and you know, the, the vaccines are distributed in different areas and go to different sort of target groups. To take one example, J&J &J is often targeted to people that have trouble uh, getting access to vaccines normally. For example, those in shelters, uh, people that are difficult to find and so on. If you really do have the option, 
I think the mRNA vaccines have the most solid data. Both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines showed the highest levels of uh, protection uh, in, in the field. So if, if, if you have your druthers, it may be better. On the other hand, um, if you're concerned about getting it over and done with, uh, then the J&J is a perfectly good vaccine. The concerns about uh, the clotting that arose remain very, very rare, a couple cases per million. So this remains a very safe vaccine and is effective. It's been field tested more against some of these variants than the mRNA vaccines, which have only been field tested in the United States and Israel primarily. So I think um, that's something to consider also. And are there any trials going on with other vaccines that we should be paying attention to? Oh, very many. How much we should be paying attention to, I think is limited by the fact that many of these vaccines are being produced for other countries by other countries. So India has a vaccine program, obviously China does. Russia has a vaccine that's been exported to many countries, but none of these have come into the United States. We really relied on our own uh, development programs here. There are two other vaccines that may well be uh, licensed in the United States this year. One is the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, that's been heavily used in, in Europe in particular, it was developed in the United Kingdom at Oxford University. Uh, and the other one is a US company called Novavax, which is um, completing its big phase three trial. And actually people are waiting for the announcement on the results of that uh, at this time. So uh, by the time we uh, broadcast this, there may be some information, but I think those are the, those are the, um, the five that, that really uh, are possibilities for US citizens, at least within the next year or so. And do those two additional ones, the Novavax and the AstraZeneca, are they mRNA? No, they're, they're quite different. The AstraZeneca is, is closest to the J&J &J in that it uses uh, an adenovirus vector or delivery system, not the same one as J&J, uh, as, um, &J, but somewhat similar uh, and uses, a, it basically puts the DNA for the spike into that, into that viral vector uh, and, uh, the other one, the Novavax, is a, is a completely different technology where it, the DNA is produced and combined with a particle uh, that's made in an insect system, actually. So they're, they're different from the mRNAs. They're not mRNA vaccines. You mentioned about boosters um, in relation to the variants. Um, and obviously this is also new, but do they have predictions about how long vaccine immunity is expected to last? <laughs> That's still an open question. Uh, and I, I'm expecting uh, probably the need to get a booster for any of the vaccines at some point. That's just, that's just um, likely, I think, based on all the tests that have been done. They show that the mRNA vaccines in particular seem to have a very good antibody response for at least six months. Whether that goes out to a year or longer, you know, we just have to wait and see what the data shows. Um, and the other, we mustn't forget about the other big arm of the immune system, which is the T cell uh, system, the cellular immunity, which is much harder to test for. You don't read that much about it, in, at least in, uh, in the lay literature. Uh, in the scientific literature, T cell responses are very good to these vaccines. So they may actually be able to keep protection clinically, even if the antibody level is falling. So we, we have to sort all those things out going forward. And with today's announcement about people being vaccinated are able to be indoors or outdoors without their masks on, uh, there's a question, can you still carry or transmit the virus once you've been fully vaccinated? Well, the, the answer is yes, it's possible, but you should feel pretty good about your ability to not be uh, sort of a carrier. Uh, there was a study done in Israel of this question uh, of the Pfizer vaccine, one of the two mRNA vaccines, and that was a real world study of healthcare workers. What it showed was in that setting, um, the Pfizer vaccine provided 86% protection against asymptomatic infection. 
So that's pretty good. It's not 100%, but it's, it's pretty good. The protection for symptoms was 97% in the real world, so, which is very close to the clinical trial result of about 95%. So these are, these are just spectacular vaccine results. It's very hard to find vaccines that have ever worked this well. Someone asks, should we ask our CF centers or our primary physicians to be monitoring our antibody levels following the vaccine to see how long CF patients are protected? So this was very specific to those with CF. Short answer, no. <laughs> and, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One is just the difficulty of getting a universal antibody test. There are all kinds of different antibody tests that are out there. Uh, and the second and probably most important reason is that nobody has been able to directly correlate a particular antibody level from a particular antibody test with clinical protection. Uh, we really have to look at clinical protection in terms of just following people and seeing who gets sick and so on. So um, the general recommendation has been, no, don't worry about getting an antibody test to see how long you're protected. What is the current protocol and vaccine recommendation for those with lung or other organ transplants due there to their required immunosuppressant therapies? Yeah, this is a really important question for our community, of course. And here, unfortunately, the news is not so good. Um, now there are studies, there are studies of people that have gotten solid organ transplants, including lung transplants, but also studies in people that are immunosuppressed with hematologic malignancy kidney transplantation, liver transplantation, they all show that people who have been either transplanted or on significant immunosuppressive medications do not get as well protected. And in some cases, there's quite a bit of difference um, between these groups and, and the general population. So for people that um, either have advanced disease uh, and certainly those that have been transplanted, I think, a great deal of caution is still, is still required. And the CDC, as, as you noted, we're talking today on May 13th. Today is the day the CDC made its huge announcement that masks are no longer necessary for full, fully vaccinated people in most situations. Uh, and if you read the fine print on the announcement, they still say if you're immunocompromised and they leave that as a sort of vague term, but that would include transplant people and people on immunosuppressive medication, you have to cons you should consult your physician. Uh, they don't actually spell it out exactly what you should do, but the implication is you do not. Uh, you should still be cautious. You're probably going to need masks in most situations where you're exposed, uh, uh, unless you're you know at home with your family and so forth. So, I think that's a big difference from the general liberation that people are feeling today about the whole mask and gathering situation uh, in the COVID pandemic. I have to say, I met that news with a mixture of, oh, that's great. Oh, <laughs> oh too soon. <laughs> so. Right. I think obviously for the vast majority of people with CF and their families, it's tremendous news. If you're fully vaccinated and you're not in that particular group, you probably can go maskless in almost all social situations. Well, all the more reason for everybody else to be vaccinated so that we have the wall around those members of our community who have had transplants. Yeah, one thing that they that kind of got lost a little bit in, in the announcement about the masks is that one of the most important reasons to get vaccinated is so that we don't need to worry about these groups and situations of vulnerable people still being exposed and getting sick. Um, so it, it should be a, a, another stimulus to go get vaccinated if you haven't already. So if people are now, if they're fully vaccinated, able to take off their masks, even indoors, not just outdoors, um, what if one or more members of other households are not vaccinated? For example, babies or young children not yet eligible, someone who can't tolerate a vaccine, uh, how does this change indoor protocols when our household is fully vaccinated? Well, according to the, the new uh, announcement, um, if you're in a vaccinated household and you're getting together with an unvaccinated household or member of, an of a household that has an unvaccinated person, 
it's still okay to go maskless. The confidence and the protect protection from all three of the currently available US vaccines is so high that the CDC now feels that it's safe to do that. So I think that's generally good news. Obviously, if people feel more anxious about it, there's no reason that you can't continue to use masks and, and social distance. It's just that in the current situation, it's important to make sure that uh, people feel that they're, that they're safe uh, and the data does support that. So I think this is a good advice. And for most people, we can take the masks off and, and gather uh, once we're fully vaccinated. And they even include large indoor um, situations like going to a concert or a ball game uh, that's outside, but let's say you're going indoors to a basketball game. Uh, that's okay now, once you're fully vaccinated. And remember, fully vaccinated means at least two weeks after the final vaccine. If it's an mRNA, you need both doses and wait another two weeks so your immune system is fully revved up. I'm looking, just making sure, because you actually proactively answered that next question. Um, oh, yeah. So, because right. the next person was about asking about funerals and such. Um, so, it looks like things are opening up very, very rapidly and very dramatically. Um, do you have any concerns about what will happen when states completely open up and lift all masking, social distancing mandates, regardless of vaccine? Well, there's, there's a lot of disparity between the rates of vaccine in different parts of the country. Uh, you and I are in the Bay Area. Here, the vaccine uptake is over 90%. We've already reached herd immunity in the San Francisco Bay Area. If you go to other areas of the country, it may be 20 or 30% or less. So there's still a high risk of getting infected. Uh, and therefore, uh, vaccinated people maybe it's somewhat higher risk of getting asymptomatic infection. As we disclosed, it's not 100% protection against that, and they could spread the disease to unvaccinated people. So that's impetus for everyone to get vaccinated, uh, as well as to be cautious if there's low rates. The other mild joker in the situation is the prevalence of a particular variant in your area. Different parts of the US have different rates of the prevalence of these variants of concern. Um, so that could play into the efficacy of the vaccine in that particular area. And there's not full information on that at this point. In fact, the, you know, the screening for variants is still in a ramp up phase. It's not the same as the PCR test to diagnose COVID. Uh, it's a much more complicated test where they look at the full gene and look at the sequences and see what's in there uh, to, to identify a variant. Now that 12 to 15 year old uh, people are approved to receive the vaccine by the FDA, um, do you know, are there studies for lower age groups and how low are they going? Right. So um, Pfizer has just gotten approved from, for the 12 to 15 year old age group. So go get vaccinated if you're in that age group for sure and you haven't gotten it already. They are doing a pediatric trial uh, below that age, starting as young as six months. So six months through 11 years of age, that's already been started. Um, Moderna is, has also uh, done a 12 to 15 year old trial. They've not yet submitted their information. So they're a little bit behind Pfizer uh, in terms of the regulatory process. Uh, and they've also initiated a similar six month to 11 year old trial. So both mRNA vaccines are now being studied in kids as young as six months. Uh, and the emergency use authorization for Pfizer is, is on the books and people are, you know, young adolescents are eligible and should get vaccinated. J&J &J is also doing a 12 to 17 trial. Their approval starts at 18. So they're, they're completing a 12 to 17. To my knowledge, they've not yet initiated a below 12 trial yet. But all of these vaccines eventually are going to be but I'd say all, most I think will we'll get studied in, in kids if they get approved in adults. They'll start moving into the pediatric population. Um, there is some controversy about whether it's necessary to, to vaccinate kids below the age of 12. 
I just saw a story, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times today, questioning that, saying we should ship those vaccines to India rather than vaccinating our kids. That's kind of a moral question that really um, is not so much a scientific question. On the other hand, we know that between three and 600 children in the United States have died from COVID. These are kids below the age of 18. So at least some of those are below the age of 12. So, you know, how far do we want to go to protect all of our children? So there's a lot to think about in terms of at least the pre-adolescent pediatric population. I can tell you most infectious disease people strongly support the idea of vaccinating children as well as uh, adolescents and adults. Yeah, that is a hard, the macro to the micro because every single one of those losses you can yeah, when you, look, when you look at what's going on in, in the developing world, uh, particularly South Asia, but also Southeast Asia now and Latin America, uh, the need is tremendous and the supply is, 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 is just not there. So I think we're entering the stage now where the international nature of putting an end to this has come to the fore. Here in the US, we finally turned the corner. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's close. But um, there's a huge amount of work to be done to get the rest of the human population protected from this disease. For those of us that cannot receive a COVID-19 vaccine for medical purposes, how much protection does the seasonal flu shot provide? Should we consider getting booster shots for the flu more often as a secondary option to help protect us? Well, the flu shot sh does not protect against this virus at all. Uh, it, it, it's pretty specific. It is specific for the flu virus, which is a different virus, quite a different virus. And so the, even though we had a very low flu year, the reasons for that probably have to do with the social distancing and the masks and the things that we did for COVID. Um, a lot of infectious disease doctors are worried about next year's flu season. They think that we might be in for a big flu season uh, because of a sort of a rebound effect that so few people were infected this year with the flu. So it's important to get the flu shot, the seasonal flu shot annually as people with CF and many others you know, do. Uh, certainly we shouldn't back off of that, but that's not gonna protect you against uh, COVID at all. And then lastly, uh, somebody who is wondering, once they do start going to funerals, graduation parties, et cetera, if they are not feeling comfortable and prefer to wear a mask, can you please remind me about what is the most effective way to have protection wearing a mask? Meaning, I think there's the keeping your things to yourself, but what is the best way to be protected from others? And so I think it's a revisiting that we did so much in the very beginning about what's the optimal mask to wear, double masking, et cetera. Right. Um, yeah, there's, there's now a large uh, body of work on masks, obviously. And the most effective are the N95s, but they're also uh, more difficult to come by and less comfortable. They have a tight fit. Um, so most people are using either a single layer or double layer of, of, of cloth masks um, for that purpose. Uh, surgical masks and cloth masks are probably the best double combination to use. Um, and social distancing should remain uh, an issue. So for the high risk people, for example, if you've had a lung transplant, you should still maintain all the current recommendations about you know, the, the distancing and the mask wearing. Uh, and hand washing if you're in close contact. So those things I think remain for the highly vulnerable population. But I would say for the vast majority of CF patients and their families, uh, we're, we're there. You can, you can get out there once you've been fully vaccinated and live your life. I don't know, I want to ask another single question. <laughs> the most positive, wonderful end to a podcast we've had since this thing started. So. Can I mention one more thing? Of course. Um, I, I should mention this. You know, I think the last time we talked, there wasn't anything that could be given to somebody who uh, had a risk for getting sick early, you know, in terms of a intervention. There, there were things that were used for people that were already in the hospital. 
steroids, remdesivir. We now have at least two commercial products. They're called monoclonal antibodies. Each one is a combination. And you get it by infusion. You, the earlier you get it after being diagnosed, the better it works, but it has been shown to reduce the likelihood of getting very sick. So that's something which is out there. And I think this would include people with CF if you actually do get sick or get diagnosed, um, this would be an option, but you'd have to do it earlier rather than later because it, it loses its effectiveness with each day that goes by. Um, and there are many places around the country that you can do this, um, but you have to go into some facility, infusion center or clinic to get the antibody. It's given by uh, IV. They're looking at subcutaneous injections now, but it's approved now just for people with a high risk of getting sick, and we can identify such people uh, who are test positive, but early in the course before they're very sick. So I just wanted to put that out as another thing that folks should know about. Uh, e either of these combination of antibodies uh, work quite well uh, at reducing the severity of, of the uh, illness that occurs. And so for somebody who um, is in that situation, would they, if it's not available in their area, they would push their physician to hopefully send them to a center that does this? Um, the availability is a problem, uh, and also the expense. I have to admit, these are these are expensive uh, biological drugs. Uh, but the main thing is the access, like you mentioned. So, uh, in most metropolitan areas of the country, it's readily available. Uh, in the rural areas and the distant areas, it may be more of a problem. But I guess that would work through each person's personal physician to ask about that. Um, if, in fact. Uh, you become positive and you're worried about um, the severity of the illness. And just to clarify, this is not, you haven't been, and you're not in the hospital, but you have now, you have COVID, you're feeling sick, you're worried it's going to take a turn. Right. These monoclonal antibodies are for outpatients, people that are not yet in the hospital. So, so much has happened in 14 months to think, I mean, literally the first podcast we had during the town hall, there was just a handful of cases in the United States and to think. And we all thought, well, maybe let's wait a couple of weeks and this thing will blow over. <laughs> Stay home, sort of like a, no, no. Yeah. No, quite different. Well, I am so grateful to you for once again, answering all of our questions. I know more will come in. Uh, for anybody who's watching this uh, prior to July, 2021, I'm happy to share that Dr. Moss will be presenting and giving an update on COVID-19 and CF um, at our conference. So please register for that. Um, and Dr. Moss, there are no words. You have guided us through, <laughs> given us so much important information and really reassured many of us with your knowledge. So thank you. Thank you. And if you haven't gotten your vaccination, go out and get it now. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.